thanks, Jim, for inviting me here today, and thanks to all of you for being here to listen to what I have to say about an experiment we conducted to look at um, the relationships between salmon habitat and salmon abundance in two intensively water monitored watersheds in coastal Mendocino County, California. This uh, experiment is part of a larger before-after control impact experiment that we're conducting, and I'm going to explain that as well. Um, so I want to start off my talk, um, introduce the life cycle monitoring work we do as part of the intensive modern watersheds. <clears throat> Next, I will um, give you some background information from our previous studies that form the basis of the hypotheses we're testing with our before-after control impact experiment. Um, then I will, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Then I'll introduce the Backy study, talk about the summer habitat data and summer fish abundance data stuff that we collect, and lead into then talking about this smaller experiment where we, um, we're looking at relationships between fish and their habitat. Um, I'll go through, tell you what we did, um, give you the results, and then finish off talking about what I think it means. Before I get started, I want to introduce my co-authors. Uh, Joe Fiera is a statistician with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Emily Lang is a fisheries biologist with Campbell Global. Uh, Wendy Holloway is a fisheries biologist with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. And Dave Wright is a project manager with the Nature Conservancy. So this, uh, this map shows the intensively modern watersheds we work on in uh, coastal Mendocino Cali in California. Um, putting creeks on the top, let me see if I can get the pointer to work. Well, there's Pudding Creek, South Fork Noya River, Casper Creek, Little River, and the North Fork Navarro River. These streams are all life cycle monitoring streams as part of the California Coastal Salmon Monitoring Plan. Um, I'm just going to talk about Casper Creek and Pudding Creek for the rest of the talk. In all these streams, we estimate total salmon adult escapement. We do complete red censuses in all the spawning habitat in these streams, so we can estimate the total number of reds, the total number of nests, the total number of eggs that are posited. We estimate um, smolt abundance production. And in Casper and Pudding Creek, we estimate summer and fall par abundance. And we pla I placed these pictures of all these uh, estimates of fish abundance at the different life stages over a top of a picture of habitat because with the infrastructure involved to estimate the, the metrics we're interested in for the Coastal California Monitoring Plan, which is primarily marine and freshwater survival, it takes a lot of infrastructure and energy just to estimate those variables. And because we have that infrastructure, we can really start looking at relationships between fish and habitat. So uh, some of our previous studies, we worked at, looked at our first 10 years of our data set um, in our 2012 paper. And just some, pri the, some of the main results that are form the basis of the hypotheses we're testing with our Backy study are, um, first of all, we found there's a strong I indication of density dependence somewhere between eggs and smolts. In the freshwater life stage, there's no density dependence in the ocean. Um, what this graphic shows is something called the importance factor graphed against the number of eggs produced. So somewhere between eggs and smolts in the freshwater life stage, there's density dependence occurring. Um, so that means there's uh, space limitation, product, pr pr predation, comp competition, not enough food, something. And if we can figure out where in the, between eggs and smolts that density dependence is occurring and focus our restoration efforts to fix that part, we should be able to make more smolts, which is then going to ultimately lead to recovery, which is what this whole game's about. Um, our second observation is that um, we found a strong negative relationship between coho salmon part of smolt survival and second win winter high flows. And we reason that means that overwinter habitat is limiting. There's not enough slow water off channel habitat, and that is influencing survival. And then finally, we document that um, summer is the real low growth period for these fish in these streams. 
And so we developed uh, before before after impact control designed experiment. Um, Casper Creek is our control stream. Pudding tree Creek is our treatment stream. And we're we're going to monitor these. Um, we've been monitoring a whole set of variables uh, pre-treatment since 2011. 80% of Pudding Creek was treated with large wood this summer, and we'll be monitoring all of our metrics for a number of years afterwards to see if it makes a difference. Um, this slide, don't, don't bend your eyes trying to figure out, look at this slide. This is just to show you that we spent a lot of time thinking about all the metrics we needed to monitor, how we were gonna monitor, and how they fit into our experimental design. And I'm just gonna talk about the summer habitat part of this and the summer abundance part of this as we continue forward. In order to estimate the total amount of habitat available in both streams, we needed a rapid tool to do that that could, would, be we would be reproducible. So every time two people went out to measure it, it was measured the same way. And so what we did was we took the, we followed the Columbia Habitat Monitoring Protocol for all the, the variables that are not associated with all the cool uh, two-dimensional, uh, what the digital elevation modeling stuff that Steve talked about. On top of that, they collect all, this, all these variables, and these are variables that are normally collected in any um, salmon habitat monitoring thing. And so we've developed a way to, to do that so we could census the entirety of both streams in the summer and the winter quickly. And so what we do is we march up the stream and we measure every single habitat, identify it, measure the length, width, and depth, and every 10th habitat of each habitat unit type, we measure all 29 of those variables. And so in both streams, and so what we end up with then is a systematic random collection of a whole bunch of habitat unit types in both streams where we have collected all of those 29 physical habitat variables. Um, we did some work, some preliminary studies in 2011 and 2012 to dial down our experiment for looking at relationships between fish and habitat. And in 2013, we went out and we randomly selected 10 of each of the five um, uh, uh, most abundant ha habitat types in the two streams and um, went out and randomly selected those and then went out and electrofished them. So we estimated fish abundance. And so what we have is a um, spatially balanced, two-factor randomized experimental design to look at relationships between fish and habitat. And I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. That took a lot of work to get to there. We boiled all the data, refined it all down, got it some spreadsheets. I thought, okay, this is gonna, this is gonna be pretty easy now. I just do some uh, general linear modeling, write some R code, and we should know the answer in a couple weeks. But that's when I discovered, oh wait, I forgot to tell you that, um, so I have, now I have a collection, random collection of uh, the salmon abundance with all these 30 variables, and I thought I'd run the R code, okay, it'd be real easy, but guess what? It's not. It's a really hard problem, multivariate analysis, and everybody that's tried to make relationships between fish and their habitat have stumbled along and found the same problem. It's really not easy to do. The reason it's easy, not easy to do, and don't bend your eyeballs on this one either, these are just uh, a scatter plots of all the variables against one another, and the point of this slide is that a whole lot of the variables are super high, highly correlated with one another, and that messes up the math. So the first thing we did once we discovered this was a problem is we boiled our data set down to these 17 variables that were, seemed to be less correlated with one another. Well, multicollinearity was still a problem. And so uh, Joe Fiera suggested we use something called factor analysis. And factor analysis is a variable reducing tool that takes a whole bunch of variables and looks for linear combinations of them that best describe each other and they convert all those variables into factors. And the factor, the cool part is the factors still retain the original variable information. Uh, this is an illustration that's supposed to help you understand how factor analysis works. I found it on Wikipedia. Um, go ahead and read about it on Wikipedia to your heart's content. I just wanted to be able to show you that I know how to use the internet. 
Um, so the first thing we had to do in this factor analysis is how many factors do we tell it to, to look for? And so we do that with the principal components analysis. This graphic on the, what would be on the left, is a scree plot, comes out of principal components analysis, and it basically, when the variance gets down below one, that tells you how many factors. So it says use seven, that we use seven. This is the normal thing that comes out of principal components on the right here. A um, lot of cool stuff there I don't really have time to talk about. Um, and so what we're, what, when we're done, what it did was it took all those 17 variables and turned them into seven factors. So here's our list on the far left of all the variables. Um, the factors are across the top, and the little numbers are the loading coefficients for those factors. If they're bold, they're significantly associated with the factor, and the sign of the coefficient tells you how it's related. So at this point, this is my, my job as a biologist to go try to put some names onto these factors, things that mean, that mean something to fish something we can help interpret to understand what's going on. And so, because I'm clever, I came up with some really uh, juicy names for these. This one was com composed of wood and uh, unit volume, so called it volume on large wood. Next one was all wood, so that was pretty easy, called it wood. This one was primarily overhead vegetation cover for fish. Um, this one was kind of a catch-all, but I interpreted the inclusion of uh, boulders and cobbles to mean turbulent water, and then stream because Casper and Pudding Creek are slightly different in their substrate. <coughs> the next one I called slow water and volume because I interpreted the inclusion of a lot of sand to mean that's where water's, uh, you know, sand settling out, so it's w slow water. Um, this one I called fast water, and then the last one was pretty easy, it's just undercut banks. There's a couple more things that are important about this slide, and it's, it's really, it's of the, the variables that were ne not included in any of the factors that's kind of interesting. Be bedrock and aquatic vegetation weren't important to any of the factors. And that's kind of easy to explain because there's not a lot of bedrock and there wasn't a lot of aquatic vegetation in either Casper or Pudding Creek. The one that's really interesting to me, and we'll come back to at the end of the talk here, is that habitat unit type was not important to any of these factors. And any of you that have done any of this, you know you spend a lot of time wondering, is that a riffle? Is it, if it's not broken water on the top, I don't know, right? Well, it might not be that important. It wasn't in this analysis. And I'll come back to why that works out really well for us. So the next thing we did was some more high pollutant statistical stuff. We did negative binomial regression modeling against those factors. This is the results. Um, so we have salmon abundance on the left, our seven factors across the top. Positive or negative means it was positively or negatively associated with fish abundance, and NS means not significant. Um, I don't have enough time to tell you all the cool stuff about steelhead, so I'm just going to focus for the rest of the talk on coho. If you want to read all about this, it's in... Um, the 2014 edition of the, Cal the journal California Fishing Game, um, and you can read the whole paper there. But I'm just gonna go back to the coho part of this now. Here's our, the slide again with the factors and the loading, loading coefficients. And coho salmon were positively associated with a factor we called volume in dry large wood, which is par primarily habitat unit volume. They were positively associated with the factor I called slow water volume, which is primarily sand, meaning slow water, and they were negatively associated with fast water, which, I, which is primarily these, the negative relationships with the smaller uh, substrate size. So we did a lot of work to get to this result. And it wasn't really, it was a little less than satisfying because anybody that knows anything about coho salmon knows you go out and stick your head in the stream and here's your dry large wood that makes a scour hole in the winter time. There's the sand, there's the slow water, there's the volume. That's where you're gonna find coho salmon if you go in the stream. The literature's pretty clear on that. 
the, the coho salmon like deep water. Um, and here's our fast water, right? Coho salmon aren't going to be there. Literature's kind of clear about that. However, we have now shown with a balanced statistical survey design, multivariate statistical analysis for our streams where we're working, that habitat unit volume and slow water are really important for coho salmon. And I think that's important. And that's where, it, this is where it starts to get interesting because now we can start understanding what that means. So this graphic shows coho salmon summer growth, so that's July to October growth along the y-axis, and total habitat volume for Pudding Creek for 2011 to 2013. And what we see is a real strong positive relationship. When there's more habitat volume, fish grow better. Here's the density dependence. We're graphing that same salmon summer growth against total uh, coho salmon of par abundance, and we see a negative relationship. So when there's more habitat, they grow better. When there's more habitat volume, they grow better, but when there's more fish, they grow less. So that's the density dependence. There's a physical habitat. We can take it a step further. See a real, this, so this is coho salmon par to, to smolt survival versus again, total habitat volume in Pudding Creek. Super strong positive relationship. Obviously, habitat volume has a lot to do with survival. Here's the density to dependence again, right? Coho salmon part of smolt survival versus total coho salmon abundance in Pudding Creek, and it's a negative relationship. So <coughs> more, uh, more fish, less survival. More habitat, more survival. And so um, this is a longitudinal profile graph of uh, Cass Creek, which is a tributary to the South Fork Noyo. Um, before and after log treatment. Um, the dark line is the pre-treatment uh, channel, and then the two colored lines are the post-treatment, and then you get the, the circles and squares are where the logs went. And obviously, putting logs in this stream is making divots in the stream channel. That's gonna make more volume. And so we really think that we're gonna see a positive impact from our experimental treatment as we monitor into the future with our backy study. And we also think that our, that our finding that summer habitat volume is important has a lot of implications for ha uh, restoration prescriptions in other watersheds. And with that, I will take questions. A plunge pool is like where I any kind of thing is backing up water and water's dropping down and causing scour. Usually in these streams, the thing that forms habitat is logs. So it's where water's being backed up on by a log and then dropping over and scouring a pool. How about recruitment? Do you um, relate to recruitment? You know, like, I mean, do you need many more salmon? You know, because you said uh, um, it was habitat dependent. So you need more salt because you have to do this. Anyway. Right. So our, I didn't mention because I was talking about this little small experiment we did as part of the larger backy experiment, but our ultimate variable to determine the su success of the, the treatment is um, smolts per spawner. And so that's a measure of freshwater recruitment and productivity. Thank you. All right.